Good morning. That's my church. That's my Matthew and Dr. Richard. And a little plug right there. That's all original music. And I did bring some of Matthew's CDs with me, so I'll have them afterwards. Um, Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for this gorgeous, gorgeous day. It's a little warmer than it was in April. I appreciate that. So when I sit down to develop an idea, it usually starts with something in my heart, something I've been thinking about wrestling with. And it's so interesting to me that the more I study, the more I learn, the more I practice, the more questions I seem to have. I don't know why it works that way. I don't know if that makes me a good student or a lousy one, but it kind of um, is what it is, I guess. And I hope that listening to my story today might resonate just a little bit with all of you. And I'd like to begin with a couple of questions. They're kind of rhetorical, but has anyone out there ever felt unworthy or unlovable or maybe even just plain old not good enough? Yeah, I I do. I am. All of that. Um, My talk today, like a traditional play, is divided into three acts. And spoiler alert, you, you all are the hero. So there you go. Settle in. The title of my little play is called You Are Very Good Enough. And let's jump in to act one which is called, yes, you are God, whether you know it or not. But first, a little bit of history, some of which you may know, but we can refresh a little. Unity may not say explicitly that you are God, but Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore does say that you are one with God. I'm not going to split this hair, but the hair I will split is that even Unity gets stuck in dualism. And a little sidebar here, there are several interpretations of dualism, including the one that holds that there are two forces in the universe, good and evil, or you might say God, not God. Unity doesn't accept this theory. I know you all know that. There is only one power, one force, and one truth. However, we come face to face with duality and unity as we try to recognize and embrace our oneness with God. Partly, it's the language. Forgive the English major for just a minute, but when we think of God as a subject or object distinct from I, me, or we, we can't help but set ourselves apart from the oneness with God. But finding non-dualistic language in English isn't easy, but we'll soldier on. Because sometimes the best way around This is to forget language altogether and go straight to feeling. For example, in prayer, we may simply quiet ourselves and focus on that sense of being one with everything, the wave in the ocean of spirit. Those divine moments tend to come when we sense deep within and feel within the depth of our bones that we are pure and simple one with the one. For most of us, this likely needs to be a daily practice, but we'll get to that in act two. Some interesting history about oneness. One thing we tend to forget about Judaism is how extraordinary the idea of one God was in the century preceding the common era. While there were some other religions, Zoroastrianism, for example, that were monotheistic, At the time, Judaism, in its pre-Jesus practice, was unique in its belief in one God. Polytheism, practiced by the Greeks and Romans and Egyptians at the time of Jesus, was clearly dominant among Middle Eastern cultures. When Jesus teaches that the kingdom of heaven is within, he means that the presence of God can be found within each individual. Sound familiar? Yeah. In unity, we like to say that God is not person, but principle. Thank you again, Mr. Fillmore. But this relationship becomes personal when we, and I quote Fillmore here, recognize God within us as our indwelling life, intelligence, love, and power. If we believe, and I do, that this was truly Jesus's message, 
we must understand how revolutionary and radical a notion that it was at its time and still continues to be, frankly, and one that certainly flies in the face of religious authority, both Jewish and Christian. If God is a state of consciousness that is characterized by love, peace, and joy that is accessible to all who seek it, then establishing a power structure is a little bit difficult. And this doesn't go over well with people who are interested in control and power. Let's just go with the notion that Jesus suggests that we look within ourselves to find God and that by turning inward and developing our spiritual awareness, we can experience the kingdom of heaven right here and right now. So, this puts the pressure on you, me, to take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. No priest can forgive you. No number of Hail Marys or other form of penitence can make you free. It's up to you. And there's the rub. <laughs> Even in unity, we are encouraged to develop the Christ within, and this usually means doing things that Jesus would do, you know, forgiving others their trespasses, being kind to your neighbor, giving to those who are poor in spirit and finances, and in general, living an authentic life with an open heart. So much easier said than done, right? How many times have I withheld the gift of my time or love, snapped at my kids, challenged my husband for no reason, you can attest. Judged my neighbor for, oh, I don't know, the color of their car, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or committed any number of infractions, small or large. But the worst part, the worst part is how I berate myself after I have committed these sins. And remember, by sin here, we mean its original definition of missing the mark or falling short of divine perfection. Yeah, guilty. When I recognize that I have sinned, my inclination, my inclination, maybe not yours, is to beat myself up and then settle into a really fun pity party <laughs> of complete and utter unworthiness. This is a downward spiral that can be quite dangerous if left untreated. If you have any inclination to do as I do, I would encourage you to take a lesson from the clip I'm about to show you. Let me set the stage. This scene is from the second season of The Chosen, which is, if you haven't seen it, a historical drama based on the life of Jesus seen through the eyes of those who knew him. While it uses scripture and gospel as the basis for the story, the creator, Dallas Jenkins, does acknowledge that some of the scenes are plausible rather than factual, of course. Editorial comment here. That's true of most of the Bible, but that's another topic for another day. Um, in this scene, we see the story of the Good Samaritan told from the perspective of one of the perpetrators as he admits his crime to Jesus and his disciple. This criminal, Moloch, has explained that his starving and sick family drove him to rob the man on the road. He is deeply ashamed and saddened by his crime, but let's listen to what Jesus tells him. So now you know what you've done. The kind of man you've helped. Every day I think about that Jew. Naked and alone on the road, possibly dead. <laughs> I could be a murderer. He didn't die. Somebody came along and helped him. How do you know? Melek. I know. I promise you. He did not die.
Why did you come all the way out here? Isn't everyone in town falling at your feet? The shepherd leaves the 99 on the mountain to search for the one that went astray. The one that went astray. <laughs> Most of us probably haven't committed an act of this magnitude, but I think the lesson that we can take here is forgiving ourselves as Jesus really would want us to do. To sum up, there is absolutely no relationship between how good you are and how much God loves you or how well your life will go. But note, however, even in this scene, acknowledging and taking responsibility for our actions is critical to one's own sense of self-acceptance and ultimately forgiveness. We are all human, and as a result of our humanness, we will all sin at some point. It's just what's going to happen. But taking accountability for those deeds does bring us one step closer to personal peace. So this brings us to Act 2, which I call in the immortal words of Nike, stay with me, just do it. <laughs> Some people may be able to embrace their true God nature and kick back and everything's just easy peasy. Yeah, this doesn't work for me and I probably doesn't work very well for you. And if it does, please see me after service because I want to know your secret. <laughs> Let me preface what I'm about to say with a caveat. You can't good works your way to a happy, stress-free existence. For those of you who think, if only I'm good enough, if only I envision the correct outcome, chant the right mantras, and leave the right offerings, my life will go swimmingly. Mm. I have news for you. Life still happens. Jesus says it much more eloquently, however. Let's look at another brief clip from The Chosen. When I was a little girl, my father told me the Messiah would bring an end to pain and suffering. If you are who people are saying you are, when will you do that? I'm here to preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven. A kingdom that is not of this world. A kingdom is coming soon, or yes, sorrow and sighing will flee away. I make a way for people to access that kingdom. But in this world, bones will still break, hearts will still break. But in the end, the light will overcome darkness. It is the nature of this incarnation here, here on this planet Earth anyway, that, as Jesus said, bones will still break and hearts will still break. Perhaps in some distant future, when we all choose to live as if we are the great mind creating all of this reality, things might be different. Well, that's another reason for living a Christ-like existence, and that's another topic for another talk. But I do know that during times when I was working really hard on my spirituality and trying to make the most Christ-like choices in any situation, I experienced some of my most difficult challenges. Just to name a few in the span of three years. My best friend died at 51. My father died. I got diagnosed with a lifelong health condition. Another dear friend died at 50. Then my mother died. My cat died. My other cat died. My kid got really sick. She's actually in the hospital right now, even as we speak. And I lost my high-powered tech job that I had had for about 20 years. 
And right after that, as some kind of cosmic joke, COVID hit. Woohoo! <laughs> and when bad things happen to good people, a book I relate to, along with my best buddy Job, <clears throat> uh, author Harold S. Kushner disabuses us of the traditional notion that our behavior and actions determine the outcome of our lives. I quote, the idea that God gives people what they deserve, that our misdeeds cause our misfortune, is a neat and attractive solution to the problem of evil at several levels, but it has a number of serious limitations. It teaches people to blame themselves. It creates guilt where there is no basis for guilt. It makes people hate God, even as it makes them hate themselves." End quote. Uh, no, thank you. I am not signing up for this. No. Some of you may easily accept the notion that you are whole and perfect just the way you are and go on to live that on a daily basis. And I applaud you. But I can tell you again, <laughs> I'm not one of those people. For me, it's like Carnegie Hall. It requires practice, practice, and more practice to keep going. And if it makes you feel any better, the renowned playwright August Wilson said, I love this quote, your willingness to wrestle with your demons will cause your angels to sing. <laughs> Thank goodness. But how do we go about this? In order to wrestle with our demons, we do need to get into fighting shape. For our purposes, that typically involves prayer, meditation, and giving. As I mentioned before, meditation helps provide that foundation of self that enables you to recognize your emotions and respond to them in an optimal way. I believe that prayer trains you to know what it's like to feel that immersion, that oneness, that sublime sense that you are part of the great whole and bask in that existential sense of oneness and love. Which brings us to our third act, and it's the shortest one with a very, very happy ending. I call it, it gets easier, I promise, but it gets easier because of the practice. A number of things contribute to this ease, I think. First of all, back to our friend, meditation. If you train yourself to be aware of distraction, which as we know is the fundamental first step in a mindfulness meditation practice, you will start noticing distracting sensations and other physical feelings more easily. Even better, as you begin to identify what emotions those feelings are signaling, you become, oh, so much better at determining how to respond. This gives a feeling of self-mastery over what you can control, your feelings and reactions. Even in the middle of a sh sugar store, you can figure out how to, if not embrace the mess, at least ride the storm out with equanimity. God is the force that helps us withstand and be present for life's challenges. Prayer practice helps you live in the connection with your divinity to honor and experience the truth of your existence. You come to understand that you are, as we say in unity, spiritual in nature. It prepares you to weather the storms of life by knowing the truth of who you really are and remembering that is what will get you through. Well, what does this look like anyway? Let's take it on a sliding scale. At first, maybe the things that used to be annoying turn into a little bit of fun. You may learn that smiling at the checkout clerk at QFC and asking him about his day actually makes you feel better. As you move on up, you may discover that you don't dread calls with your mother so much anymore. Maybe by actively listening to her instead of fuming at her complaints, you hang up the phone sensing that you've helped an old lady. And that feels good. Ooh, somebody can relate. <laughs> Further along, you may find yourself calling the local animal shelter to volunteer to walk dogs or clean cages. And at the end of your shift, your heart is singing. Or 
When your spouse is having a really bad day and uncharacteristically lashes out at you, instead of entering into a knockdown drag out, you can muster up the emotional resources to remain calm. That's the challenge of the week. You may even be able to see things that were once onerous as an opportunity to dig deeper and give your life meaning, which of course leads to more self-awareness and self-confidence. And even when bones break, you have the resilience to heal them. And that is pretty awesome. But one caution though, just when you think you have eradicated the last of the demons, one will pop up in a game of cruel karmic whack-a-mole. <laughs> but with all your practice, you will be much better prepared to stop them in their tracks, so to speak. And of course, nobody can put it better than Mr. Rogers, who says, discovering the truth about ourselves is a lifetime's work, but it's worth the effort. Let's practice for a few minutes, allowing you to explore the incredible powers you have within yourself to create all you need rather than to try to find it outside yourself. You might ask yourself, what do I seek that I don't already have within? And explore that feeling as we meditate together. I invite you to get as comfortable as you can, wherever you are, perhaps closing your eyes and simply asking your physical body to settle in as deeply and comfortably as you can. Take a breath and scan your body, noticing any areas of tension or discomfort or tightness and breathe into that place. With the exhale, imagine that energy being breathed out of your body. As you take your next breath, sense the power that you have within to create whatever you need or want. You have everything you need right here and right now to feel your sense of worth and connection. Embrace that complete sense of freedom that comes from knowing the truth of your being, the access you have to being one with the true power that creates and sustains everything. Remind yourself that you have no need for the distractions or bad habits that may try to keep you wanting what doesn't really matter. Listen, listen to my words. You are created from the same stuff as everything in the universe and everything you seek has already been planted deep within your being. When you show up for yourself in your life, when you choose to be here, you can and will feel this creative power. As you continue to breathe, plant a thought of kindness towards yourself. Imagine that seed being nurtured by gentle rain and warmed by the spring sun until it begins to unfold itself and grow deep roots. When you cultivate what you have within, instead of seeking answers outside of yourself, you recognize your full potential. The less you seek, the more you remember this truth. Sit with this truth for just a couple of breaths. As we bring this time of meditation to a close, remember 
that you can come back to this place anytime you wish. You are whole and perfect just the way you are. And so it is.